Greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming. I noticed kind of the student faculty bifurcation here, but I guess that's all right. Uh, it is my pleasure um, to introduce um, the person that needs no introduction um, to talk about thick social equity. This is a particularly important topic for uh, KU right now in that uh, last year we went through a strategic initiatives uh, process uh, and came up with four major themes for the campus to focus on. Uh, and one of the things that I think is particularly important for our school is the one entitled Building Communities, Expanding Opportunities. And the expanding opportunities aspect of that um, is really within the core of um, inequality and social equity um, and there is no better person to talk about this um, than George who has really been the leader in our field in putting putting this front and forward in our discipline and in our concerns um, and so uh, it is truly an amazing pleasure to have him talk on this and I'm very interested in what thick means, and I'm sure we're going to find out <laughs> in a minute. So without further ado, it is um, very great to introduce um, the guy who calls me boss, George Becker. <laughs> well, thank you, boss. <laughs> uh, my children think the title of this lecture refers to my dimensions. <laughs> which have gotten rather thick in recent years. Anyway, uh, public ideas matter. The power of public ideas is an engine that transforms the way we live and think. Our country, for example, was founded on a particularly powerful public idea, democratic self-government. The power of public ideas is, however, seldom immediate. How and why public ideas come to matter can only be known in the passing of time. During the 1960s, I was here in the 1960s, it became increasingly evident that the benefits of government policy and the work of public administrators implementing government policy were much, those benefits were much greater for some citizens than for others. Issues of racial and class inequality and injustice were everywhere evident, the subject of open anger, indignation, outrage, and passion, riots in the streets over racial injustice and an unpopular war tended to concentrate the minds of policymakers and policy implementers. It was in this state of concentration that the phrase social equity entered the literature and later the practices of public administration. There has always been a concern for fairness and in the better practices of public administration, but it was not until the 1960s that the phrase social equity became a feature of public administration with an attendant set of concepts and a cluster of shared values. This afternoon, I shall attempt to describe what I will label thin social equity in public administration and then attempt to describe the thickening of social equity. In doing so, I shall attempt to assess the standing of social equity in the contemporary marketplace of public ideas, and particularly public administration ideas. Thin social equity. Social equity grew out of the first Middlebrook Conference in September 1968 and traces particularly to a chapter in a book entitled Toward a New Public Administration, the collected papers from that particular conference. In that chapter, I enthusiastically joined those challenging the policy administration dichotomy and the idea that public administrators could or should be objective or neutral agents of policy implementation. I argued the policy administration dichotomy lacks an empirical warrant for it is abundantly clear that administrators both execute and make policy. If public administrators are making policy, I really reason, what should be the values or guidelines for that policy making? New public administration attempts to answer that question in this way. Administrators are not neutral. 
they should be committed to both good management and social equity as values, things to be achieved, or rationales. In time, this came to be known as the third pillar perspective. The new public administration seeks not only to carry out legislative mandates as efficiently and effectively as possible, but to both influence and execute policies that more generally improve the quality of life for all, thereby adding social equity to efficiency and effectiveness to form the three pillars of public administration. That argument was challenged later in a book that has one of the great titles in the field called Without Sympathy, Without Sympathy or Enthusiasm. Uh, and <laughs> think of that, without, and I was the particular villain in the book. And, and I was accused by the author of the book by being a young, uh, referring to young bureaucratic radicals and their professors wishing to steal the popular sovereignty. Uh, anyway, from the outset, the social approach to public administration was primarily normative, built on deductive logic appealing to the moral instincts of those practicing and teaching public administration. At the time, there was empirical evidence of widespread inequality and unfairness based on public policies and on the administration of those policies. Nevertheless, the thrust of the social equity movement in public administration was primarily normative, empirical evidence was thin, and empirically based theory was meager. At the same time, we're now talking in the late 60s, early 70s, as the social equity perspective emerged in public administration, another very different perspective emerged, economics and the market model. It's interesting, the parallels in time. I could be off a decade, but not by much, I don't think. The academic discipline of economics was generally colonizing the social science disciplines at the time, including public administration, a form of applied social science. The economic market perspective dominated public administration theory and practice from the mid-1970s to the end of the 20th century and is still very much with us. Many of the elements of the economic market perspective were folded into what has come to be known as the new public management, as distinct from the new public administration, which was the label back in the 60s. This is inspired by a particular set of economic theories and normative values whose main focus is on increasing efficiency. New public management is about efficiency. It does not ask the question, <coughs> efficiency for whom? It's just efficiency. Also folded into the market perspective were other efficiency-oriented public administration applications, including performance measurement. You'll recognize these are all current today performance measurement, performance management, ranking, and other forms of program evaluation, evidence-based management, broken windows theory, city stat, and the various other stats, and a strong emphasis on accountability. Over the years, the subject of social equity and its language have changed. Equity is now more broadly defined to include not just race and gender, but ethnicity, sexual preference, certain men medical and physical conditions, even languages, and particularly variations in economic circumstances. I want to emphasize that. Particularly variations in economic circumstances. The, the so-called haves and the have-nots. It is a considerable irony that uh, in the past 40 years, 45 years, uh, as social equity has gradually grown in importance in public administration theory and practice, at the same time, in virtually all aspects of social, economic, and political life, Americans have become less equal. So the irony is, we're, as we're talking more about social equity and emphasizing it, what has happened is the opposite. At about the beginning of the 21st century, a dozen years ago, possibly in response to rapidly increasing inequality in the United States, there was an impressive increase in both, there has been an impressive increase in both empirical and theoretical social equity scholarship. Indeed, there has been an explosion of high quality social equity literature in the past dozen years. I have chosen to label this vast new literature thick social equity. Because of the limited time this afternoon, I shall briefly describe just four of the most important contributions to so-called thick social equity. 
the first and the easiest is, is called the Discovering Inequalities Perspective. And I wish to refer particularly to the report of a task force of the American Political Science Association on inequality, in which they state, our country's ideals of equal citizenship and responsive government may be under growing threat in an era of persistent and rising inequality. Disparities of income, wealth, and access to opportunity are growing more sharply in the United States than in many other nations. All of the contemporary social equity research and data seem to indicate that the terrain of social equity has shifted from a more or less exclusive concentration on the equity issues of minorities to a broad consideration of how to achieve social equity in the context of growing disparities between the haves and the have-nots, recognizing that minorities constitute a disproportionate percentage of the have-nots. Now, for, for the next two or three pages of this talk, there's a listing of all of the sort of gruesome details of inequality. I'm not going to bore you with that. You're, having gone to the recent presidential election, you've heard about the 1%. That's, that's an equity argument. The 47 percent, that's another equity argument, and, and all the various references to who is being advantaged by the tax structure, who is being disadvantaged, who ought to get more or fewer uh, taxes, so on. So I'm not going to go over that. You all know what we're talking about. You should find it a relief that I'm flipping through pages quickly here. Mm -hmm. Widening gaps between the haves and the have-nots have been made exponential by the recent recession, made worse by, for those at the bottom and also more evident to all. While the discovering inequality perspective is helpful, it does the cause of social equity little good to be able to know exactly how poor the poor are. Uh, I uh, have a little debate with some of my political science friends. They're, they're very proud of this particular report. They're very proud to have discovered inequality. Uh, and, and I'm pleased that we, we kind of know the, the question I want to ask is, now what? And to some extent, I think the difference between political science and public administration is we're about now what? What do we do now? Now, I turn to the second perspective uh, on fixed social equity. Uh, and I'm referring here particularly to the contributions of a, a relatively important new book uh, by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, the two British health researchers. The title of the book is The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Society Stronger. Have any, do any, does anyone here know what a spirit level is? Stephen, is, well, are we of about the same age? Maybe. No, What's I think it, I'm a little younger, George. <laughs> 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 Tell our fuzzy-cheeked colleagues <laughs> what a spirit level is. Well, it's a carpenter's tool, right? It's the level that measures... Uh, uh, Perfectly horizontal. Yeah, or, or vertical, I guess. I Why is it called a spirit level? Because you have a fluid, you have a bubble and a fluid, right? And what's in the bubble? What's the, the bubble is whiskey, in, I don't know. The bubble is in, is in alcohol. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in spirits. <laughs> and it, it's about trying to find horizontal. Pure or horizontal. Yes. And uh, and so they chose to call to use that idea as the title of their book, The Spirit Level. I have that app on my iPhone. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they report on extensive analysis of comparative national and state wealth inequality and individual and collective well-being. Uh, so we're going to call this the correlates of social equity, things that are correlated with equality and inequality. And for, the, uh, for this part of what I want to talk about today, you may find useful to have your, your copy of the paper available. If you don't have one, there's still some in the back. Uh, to set the stage uh, for their findings, Wilkinson and Pickett present evidence which shows that we have got close to the end of what economic growth can do for us. We have got close to the end of what economic growth can do for us. Economic growth, for so long the great engine of progress has, 
in the rich countries largely finished its work. As figure one illustrates, and I need to find figure one, which should be in the next page, you, you see that array, and you will see the rich countries in the upper right hand. You see that, that curve leveling off? That's the point. Uh, the, the issue is life expectancy, and once you get to a certain status of a so-called rich country, uh, the richer you get doesn't improve your life expectancy, nor does it improve your well-being, nor does it, it turns out, nor does it improve a lot of things. So uh, Wilkinson and Pickett were s sort of surprised by that and wondered uh, why, why growth, why economic growth starts, stops improving other social, political, and economic factors. And they came up with a different idea. If, if economic growth brings so-called diminishing returns in the real quality of human life, what should we turn to? Using data from a wide range of sources, Wilkinson and Pickett build a case for the bold assertion that one of the powerful clues to the answer to this question comes from the fact that we are affected very differently by the income differences within our own society from the way we are affected by the differences between average income between one rich society and the other. So what they're claiming is the correlates of, of, of social equity have much more to do with inequality within a country or within a state than it has to do with inequality between them. It's a quite different argument. Uh, it, uh, now if we turn to uh, figure three, it's the, it's the smaller one on the left hand. This is a comparison of per capita national income and life expectancy in the 25 richest countries in the world. As you can see, that is just essentially random. Now, if you turn to figure four, that's life expectancy and the, mat the matter of the level of inequality. And what, what that shows strongly is a close correlation between inequality and lower life expectancy. That was the, sort of their first clue. Remember, these are health researchers. Uh, uh, if you want to go back to figure two, that shows the, the, these countries and the differences in how equality and inequality are defined, if you want to do that. Let's turn to figure five. This is the UNICEF index of child well-being as compared to per capita income in rich countries. And again, there is no correlation. But when the UNICEF index of child well-being is compared to levels of income inequality in the rich countries, as shown in figure six, there is a very strong correlation. Using data from the 50 American states, we're changing now from rich countries to the states of our country and from the 25 richest countries, Wilkinson and Pickett uh, test the relationship between levels of trust and income inequality. As figures 7 and 8 show, trust is higher in countries and American states with more equal per capita income. The more equal <coughs> income, the more people tend to trust one another. They make a similar comparison in figures 9 and 10 and show the teenage birth rates are higher in rich countries and American states with higher income inequality. The same is true for comparative homicide rates and rates of imprisonment. Do you see these correlations piling up now? Well, they saw that too. Uh, and so what they decided to do is build a couple of indices. These are indices of, uh, of health and social problems, uh, one for the richest countries and the other for the 50 American states. The index for the richest countries includes measures of life expectancy, math and literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, mental illness, all of what one would describe as well-being, including drug and alcohol addiction and social mobility. The index for the American states has most but not all of the same measures. Figure 11 shows the index of health and social problems for the richest countries is not related to per capita national income but as figure 12 shows, is correlated with income inequality in those countries. 
The index of health and social problems in the American states, as figure 13 shows, is only weakly related to average income, but as figure 14 shows, is strongly correlated with inequality. Uh, using a somewhat different approach, a group of American scholars, with the support of the Russell Sage Foundation, and these are health economists primarily, uh, have taken up the same subject using a concept called biomarkers. You'll recognize biomarkers. Pulse rate, blood pressure, total cholesterol, hip to waist ratio. My hip to waist ratio is not real good. Uh, so on. Uh, they, they, found, they found results very similar to the Wilkinson and Pickett results, but their, their study is much more sophisticated statistically. The data are better, and they have some data over time. And using data over time, they could step up to the question of causality. Correlation doesn't tell you what's causing what. They, well, there are various in causality, and you can make some assumptions about the direction of causality if you have data over time, which they have done, and, uh, and are much more bold in their claims about causality than Wilkinson and Pickett. Uh, so that, uh, I will sort of rest my case with respect to the correlates of social equity claim. This is, a, I think, a strong perspective. It does considerably thicken the argument for what social equity means, both in policy and particularly in policy administration. to thickening social equity theory is labeled the intergenerational or sustainable social equity perspective. Intergenerational or sustainable equality has an important place in the study of social equity, particularly found in research on environmental justice. And I want to refer you to one particular book which I found uh, dreadfully depressing but interesting. This is a very recent book by Rob Nixon uh, called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. Slow violence is a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. Violence is customarily conceived as an event or action that is immediate in time, explosive and spectacular in space, and erupting into instant sensational visibility. We need, I believe, I being Rob Nixon, to engage a different kind of violence, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental, accretive, and, is, and its calamitous repercussions played out across a range of temporal scales. While we get glimpses of slow violence in human actions such as deforestation, acidifying oceans, global warming, the radioactive and explosive aftermaths of war, such violence cannot match the anxious presentations by the corporate media, watch your six o'clock news, of temporal violence. We are drawn politically and emotionally to a different kind of violence, burning towers, falling bodies, volcanoes, tsunamis, avalanche, avalanches, war, spect spectacles that show violence unfolding over years, decades, even counties, even, even centuries. Slow violence can't match that kind of, kind of drama. Nixon, uh, there's more detail here about Bhopal, Chernobyl, Deepwater Horizon, Katrina, and so on, but I don't want to stop on that. Nixon does describe what he refers to as shadow kingdom. The, the, we, the, the modern world is a world of shadow kingdoms. These are contemporary global corporations, and particularly global oil and chemical corporations, and what he refers to as the new colonialism. We have witnessed in the past two decades an accelerated extraction of African minerals, oil, and timber in many of the continents, African continents, least stable nations. In most of these shaky African nations, concessionary economics 
kleptocratic rule, structural adjustment, and corporate deregulation mean that irreplaceable minerals and forests are being lost for little national gain and at considerable local ruin. He treats uh, the Deepwater Horizon case and with reference particularly to British Petroleum, Halliburton, and Transocean, and points out that, uh, that there, there has been a much higher level of accountability associated with, with Deepwater Horizon because it happened uh, where it was visible to all and its potential long-term effect is, was, in, was very visible. Um, and those harmed were not without some influence. Plus, it, it had uh, night after night of media coverage for a while at least, although now we seldom hear about it or think about it. Uh, lest you think that uh, that intergenerational or sustainable social equity uh, is all terribly pessimistic and has all only to do with environmental or natural resources, uh, that's not the case. There is other uh, very rich literature. There's a wonderful book uh, by Lawrence Kotlikoff called Generational Accounting, where he takes up the matter of our social security system and the social security systems are the equivalents in other countries, our Medicare system, uh, how one generation supports the next, or, or one generation pays the bill for the next. Uh, there's, uh, there are, there's also a very good literature, those of you who aspire to be city managers will recognize this, how a city will bond, which is in essence an agreement by which you, a, a, a temporal group will oblige the next generation to pay for something, which is in essence what that is, on the assumption that what is being built will be as beneficial to them as it will be to you. And that more or less works, unless of course you're the Kansas Turnpike, um, the, the, which was built, uh, the promise being made that after it was paid for, the tolls would be removed, which was about 20 years ago. But then they discovered this thing called maintenance. And well, never mind, so we have a King's X on. Uh, but, but what, that's all, what those, those, those things are all about is, is intergenerational fairness and systems of intergenerational fairness. And people are quite clever at working out systems that are approximately fair or just. Do you think it's just that we now, when we use that road, uh, should pay for its maintenance? I'm not bothered by that, uh, nor feel that somehow uh, my parents, had they been Kansans, uh, would, would be upset because I'm having to continue to pay to use the road. I doubt that. Um, we even have one example going on in our own department. Lisa Maldivanova is doing a dissertation on the logic of sustainability as illustrated in the study of the arts, music, literature, art, uh, as, as examples of intergenerational sustainability. Okay, we turn now to the fourth or final perspective, and this approach is embarrassing to me because the person to whom I'm particularly referencing is in the room with us. Uh, so if he would like to excuse himself. <laughs> I wasn't playing that. No. Uh, Stephen Maynard Moody and Michael Mushino in their book, Cops, Teachers, Counselors, Stories from the Front Lines of Public Service, uh, studied social service officers, cops on the beat, and teachers in the classroom who all live in a world of scarce resources, scarce resources, limited time, ambiguous expectations, and conflicting rules. That's their work. To manage their way through these limitations, street-level bureaucrats apply a form of public service delivery and distribution based on what authors, the authors describe as client worthiness. Client worthiness is based on stories and master narratives that enable street-level workers to affix particular identities to their clients. For those in the helping professions, uh, clients who do not try who do not follow through and who are seen as lazy have not earned the help provided. 
They do not do their part and are unlikely to change. To the, to the police citizens who work, especially those who work hard just to keep their families, help their families scratch by, are forgiven numerous transgressions that would lead to harsh treatment for people who do not work. The line between those deemed worthy and those deemed unworthy, isn't that an interesting word to use in public service? Those deemed worthy and those deemed unworthy is thin and imprecisely drawn. There are no reliable external criteria differentiating the two. Still, in the face of scarce resources and time, choices must be made, and these choices are a form of social equity morality. Just as street-level workers will bend the rules, give second chances, and greatly extend themselves in state benefits to those deemed worthy, those considered unworthy receive the least possible service or the greatest possible punishment. Street-level workers can become harsh and unforgiving state agents when they believe that citizen clients are trying to con the system, are unresponsive, or lazy, are immoral, or unlikely to change. The day-to-day -day practices of street-level public servants is about the search for fairness, equity, and justice. Fixing and enforcing citizen-client identities forms the premise for street-level workers' judgments. Their stories reveal how street-level decisions, decision-making, in complex more is is complexly moral and contingent rather than narrowly rule bound and static. Cops, teachers, and counselors first make normative judgments about offenders, kids, and clients, and then apply, bend, or ignore rules and procedures to support their moral reasoning. Identity-based normative judgments determine which, which, and how rules, procedures, and policies are applied. Morality trumps legality in terms of which rules, procedures, and policies are acted upon, who gets what services, and who is hassled or arrested, and how rules, procedures, and policies are enacted. They have one sentence which I've taken out, and I believe if, if, if there's a better sentence in contemporary public administration literature, uh, I'd like you to bring it to me. This is as good a sentence as you're going to read. Most of the time, and in most street-level settings, small acts of normative improvisation, small acts of normative improvisation by forgotten streetwise workers sustain the state. They are acts of statecraft on which the institution of governing depends. There he is right there. <laughs> did you write that or did Mushno? Good. Yeah, that was brilliant. Well, let me conclude. Uh, Time, <laughs> time measures the importance of public ideas. From this brief review, it would seem that the time of, for social equity in public administration has come. There has been an explosion of relevant social equity research and scholarship. Social equity is now a formalized feature of the works of our primary professional organizations. As a phrase, social equity is now uh, as common as efficiency and effectiveness in the language of public administration. The great irony in thickened social equity is that it comes at a time of growing inequality in the United States. It is this irony which prompts me to conclude that those of us interested in and dedicated to social equity in public administration must express our moral indignation and our anger that we are not more equal in our cities, our states, and our nation. I believe we too often shrink <coughs> at those, for those who claim that, uh, that we are engaged in class warfare. In fact, the class, war, the class war was declared long ago, and it was not the poor or the minorities who have been the aggressors. We know from this review that greater social equity is both good public policy and good public administration. The evidence is in. The battle for greater equality is empirically based and morally right. Greater equality makes social societies stronger and more fair, populations more healthy, polities more just, and the people more free. We are paying too high a price for inequality. It is now the time to work for social equity in both public policy and administration. Thank you.
come back from sabbatical. <laughs> I'm that good a historian. I am a big Hamilton fan, however. Uh, a, uh, hard for me to call. He uh, <coughs> he was pretty deeply dedicated to to competence. To, 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 that you just don't pick anybody off the street. He, he this was before the idea of merit appointment, but uh, but uh, I think he surrounded himself with competent people. And, and it, was, it was chosen by President Washington to be the Secretary of the Treasury because he was competent and knew what he was doing. And he, he, he was the author of getting us out of debt from the Revolutionary War, which was a brilliant thing to do. Uh, but it's interesting how he did it, and that's that he borrowed from the next generation <coughs> or from people who wanted to, he had other forms of taxation. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer the question. If this were a job talk, I would be out of luck. No, I just think that Hamilton has really deeply influenced um, a lot of your thinking on oh. what, it, what it means for public administration to be sort of tied to, to his idea of the energetic executive. Right? And so, the, you know, the question, one of the assumptions behind the thick social equity is how much state intervention should be involved in, in helping manage it. Well, if you, if you go back to the assumptions associated with, uh, with the so-called new public administration and with social equity, it would argue that, that it's really emotionally impossible to be absolutely objective or neutral. That you've got to stand for something. And most people do most of the time. And that, that we want them to stand for fairness. And I think Stevens' work on street-level workers and the, the research all indicates that that equality, greater equality, is good public policy. It helps those who are, who are less than equal, but it turns out it also helps those who are being advantaged. But they're both being brought down by inequality. Um, so I, I think that, that both at the street level in terms of management that he would prefer policies that were more equal. Uh, but it's, it's hard to know. Were he here, would he support uh, uh, a steeper graduation in the in the federal income tax. Uh, it's kind of kind of hard to know uh, how, how you would assess contemporary fairness questions. Anyone else? Uh, let's try John. When you look at those uh, those two fi those figures about the relationship between income and uh, or inequality. And, and country level and at state level. The other thing that, that sort of confounds it, although it's tightly integrated, is it looks like the diversity of the countries or of the states. So how do you disentangle that? Well, the, the Pickett and Wilkinson study doesn't do that very well. The other study to which I refer does do it. It, it controls for a whole raft of socioeconomic and other contextual factors and and still shows issues of, of within a, a community or a state of equality as as very strong predictors um, and so it does control for those and Show, as you wanted to expect, it shows the correlation between, between race and, and poverty, as we would expect. All the directions are approximately what one would, one would assume, as I recall in my reading of it. Boss? <laughs> so, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Williamsburg, Virginia, at 
the Alliance Big Ideas Conference. And um, Bob O'Neill was at the front of the room um, virtually begging the city managers in the room to take social, social equality into account when making decisions and putting forward their policy options to their councils, uh, to their decision-making bodies. Um, which he also did in his speech when he was here at KU as well, made a very impassioned plea for that. And what I found interesting, and kind of comes, the question comes to me, is can you do social equity without calling it social equity? Because the response from the room was, we do that now, only the decision document has effectiveness analysis, efficiency analysis, and then other considerations. <laughs> you know, it's not, they don't, they don't explicitly put out there, um, we have a social equity issue in our community and this is part of the consideration that we should look at that. And that really bothered me mm -hmm. and I'm just interested in your perspective on, can you do it without I think yes, uh, and my guess is that uh, the, the street workers that, uh, that Stephen and Mike Michneau studied never used the phrase or even were familiar with the phrase social equity, but they were in their own way practicing it in the context of scarce resources, limited time, etc., uh, and in ways that, uh, that, are, that would certainly be an example of energetic executive at, but at the street level. Uh, uh, in, in fact, it's probably clever and smart uh, uh, to, to be subtle by the use of words that are provocative words, words that put people on edge. And uh, some words are softer. Diversity is a, a warm and comfortable word. Affirmative action is a frightening, scary, uh, uh, in many contexts, those, that word and that, that phrase mean roughly the same thing. I don't know how you say that. Yes. I have a, a follow-up about that because to me, I, I'm, I'm puzzling over why social equity has been the big, why is it the big disruptive narrative on efficiency and yeah. effectiveness, right? So yeah. that, and then secondly, why did the new public, why did the new public management Forget about social equity from the new public administration. What, uh, why, why, why? Probably because they didn't know about it, and probably because I'm not sure they agree. Um, if, if you take, take O'Neill City Manager, uh, if you say, we're going to make uh, the city more efficient in some particular respect. Would there be any problem by then saying, all right, we are, our plan is in this particular way, we're going to make the city more efficient? For someone in the staff to say, efficient for whom? Will it be universally efficient and equally efficient for all? Or will it be somewhat more efficient for those who live in this part of town or that part of town? Or those who are uh, single mothers? those who are living in elderly uh, retirement homes, for whom, so the, the so-called next question, efficiency for whom, effectiveness for whom, uh, is a pretty easy way to, to get at that. It, but it, but O'Neill is right, and you are right, it does make people uncomfortable. It's much easier to assume that we all benefit equally. So we build the University of Kansas. Is it equally useful to all Kansans? Probably not. Is it a good idea? Probably yes. How can we make it as useful uh, uh, if, if it is an efficient, effective way uh, to get young Kansans educated? Uh, how can we make it as fair and just as is possible? And I, I, and I do think our leaders are concern themselves with that. Admissions policies, advancement policies, other things of that sort. And I, I, I think it's instinctive to many good managers uh, to concern themselves with fairness, which is, a, is 
the word fairness is also one of those fu fuzzy, gentle words that can mean social equity, which is harder. Even the word social sounds. Socialist? <laughs> yes, yeah, they, they, those kinds of affairs shouldn't be public. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making no reference to any <coughs> contemporary issues. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, one of the dilemmas that, um, of course, I see very, uh, very upfront when looking at street level work is they are making these normative judgments, but many times those could enforce inequality, right? So they often do. Yeah. So that, so that, uh, the presumption that that these agents are making uh, deep normative judgments, oftentimes they may be actually reinforcing the trends of, you know, of inequality rather than, than challenging those. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think, so, so the equity issues are in play, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that the end result is something more equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of the, the challenge here. I mean, even, I suppose you could make that same critique about efficiency, just because you're talking about efficiency doesn't mean you're actually more efficient. No. Uh, and in fact, it could be the opposite, because uh, you spend so much time measuring things that you don't have any time to get anything done. I um, think issues of equity are always in play. Right, so so the issue here isn't so much that they generate uh, equality or, or could, could address some of the uh, evident inequalities in those graphs, per se, but at least uh, it's a recognition that these things are in play right, at all levels of, of, of yeah. government. Now, if you think about social equity in sort of structural uh, theoretical terms, uh, there's an interesting argument with respect to hierarchy, which is as fundamental to our field as any idea that I know about. You show me an organization, I'll show you a hierarchy, by definition. Organizations that don't have them are not going to last long. Um, and hierarchy is essentially a system of social agreement by which you agree that people are equally unequal. So if, if you are an assistant professor in your first year at the University of Kansas, uh, you would expect to be paid approximately what assistant professors in their first year are paid, unless of course they're in the medical school or in the field of economics. Well, why is that the case? Well, we have essentially an agreement that that's the case. So we, 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 are, we understand uh, differences, sometimes subtle, sometimes not subtle. But we, we, one thing we do agree upon, generally speaking, is the idea that seniority is associated with higher pay. That's simply an assumption. Uh, we, so if you look at hierarchy, it's laden with assumptions about fairness and justice and equity in terms of pay, uh, work workload, work burden, so on. Uh, so a lot of organization theory, uh, when laid out in day-to-day in -day practice, uh, can be seen in terms of fairness. <coughs> and, and, and a lot of that goes back to a kind of sociology of, of, of sort of social agreement, social understanding, uh, that then get codified, written down, and so on. Similar idea is the idea of merit. And we have reduced merit in some ways to how much education do you have? Can you pass a certain test? Do you have a certain kind of experience? Is that merit? Well, we're not really sure merit, what merit is, but we have this social understanding as to what merit is, and this is going to mean whether or not you get a job. So this is the slow violence of hierarchy? Yes. <laughs> Well, and I think in some cases we do pay a price in the longer run. Sure we do. Uh, particularly with respect to admissions policies. Yes, I've been here at the University of Kansas for 25 years, and as long as I've been here, there's been discussion of increasing the university's admission standards. Uh, well, who's, who, who would be advantaged? Who would be disadvantaged? Would the faculty be advantaged? Uh, would the students be advantaged? Which students? Who would have to work harder? Who would have to work less hard? Uh, <coughs> my guess is, 
uh, I, there are several faculty members here, but my guess is that the faculty, generally speaking, on balance, would prefer to have higher admission standards. And then if you said yes, but does that mean fewer students? Oh yes, that's even better. <laughs> fewer students. But then say, is that fair? Well, it makes our work easier, which it does. Uh, what about the the last young the last young person refused admissions? The court weighs the court the Supreme Court weighs a lot of this whenever they deal with an affirmative action case. How, how would you explain the diffusion of social equity research across the topic areas? So it started with basic racial I don't know. It's a mystery to me, but it has exploded. It's 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 going on. It's diffusing all over the place in all sorts of directions, kind of all at once. I, I'm not sure I see a pattern. The one thing I do see is that it is now once again really respectable for economists to take this matter seriously. Joe Stiglitz, new book on inequality, and he, his his book. He's an extremely frank, blunt Nobel laureate, as a matter of fact, um, who said that inequality, we're paying a terribly high price for inequality as a people. Uh, and it's not just the, the have-nots who are paying that price, we're all paying that price. And so it's fashionable among economists these days. Now these, these are generally referred to as center-left economists or left-left economists like Krugman. Uh, but still, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, the dominant voices in economics were all the other way. Not all, but most. <coughs> most of the loudest voices, certainly. 